you're back. Hi. <laughs> what are you planning on doing now? In my comings and goings, there are lots of people who are still desperate for change. So I am going to run for Maston District City Council. There was a lot of big that was coming. former candidate for mayor, India Walton. I am officially and this for is Maston. Zanetta Everhart, director of diversity and inclusion for State Center, Tim Kennedy. We need government to stop. And this Our is Cedric Holloway and Eve Shippens and Catherine Franco and Leah Halton Pope. All of these people are looking to throw a hat in the ring and join the race to become members of Buffalo's Common Council. And there are others too. Investigative host Jeff Kelly takes a look at these candidates and what it is they're running for. For Investigative Post, this is Reporters Notebook. So let's get in and let's talk about um, the elections that are about to come up, the primary elections in June. Um, Jeff, tell me what you know and tell me about these candidates. So we have nine council races and, you know, we do well to remind ourselves that every seat is an open seat, right, in an election year. It doesn't belong to anyone uh, unless the voters give it to you. So technically these are all open seats, but in fact, as I pointed out in my column last week, it's been 20 years since uh, an incumbent was unseated uh, in, on the Buffalo Common Council, a full-term incumbent. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been that long, uh, a full 20 years, and that was Jimmy Griffin, the late Jimmy Griffin, uh, the former four-term mayor. Uh, this year, there are two, open, two genuinely open seats where the, the incumbents are, have declined to run for re-election. That, that includes Common Council President Darius Pridgen, and that's a crowded field, mm -hmm. uh, apparently, mm -hmm. to looking to succeed him. And then Maston District Councilman Ulysses Wingo. He also has declined to run for re-election. Now, how long was Wingo in the seat? Wingo would have been running for his third term. Uh, and uh, Pridgen for, I th think, his fourth. Yeah, he's been, he's been there longer. Yeah, a little bit longer. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and Pridgen is sort of the big surprise. He was a very influential a uh, person in, in not just in Buffalo pol politics, but in the community at large. He mm -hmm. runs one of the biggest churches uh, in the city, uh, True Bethel Baptist. He's a truly influential figure. His decision to retire, apparently, from public office uh, is a bit of a surprise uh, and, and leaves a bit of a vacuum. And that's why so many folks are rushing in. I actually just um, earlier this week um, when Dale and I interviewed him, uh, Dale asked him why he was retiring. And he said, well, I'm not retiring. Um, and he mentioned, of course, his other endeavors um, with the church and in the community. Sure. Um, and I thought that was interesting. I, I'm, I'm certain there is a next chapter. Of course. Right. For, for Darius Pridgen, perhaps even politically, we'll find out. Hmm. Interesting. Well, let's talk about that vacuum. Um, what does such, you know, Wingo and Pridgen leaving, what does it open up? Well, potentials. let's talk about Pridgen's seat first sure. and, and the people who are, uh, who are vying to replace him. Uh, he has sort of put his hand on Leah Halton Pope, who is a senior advisor to Crystal People Stokes, who mm -hmm. is the assembly majority leader, very influential elected official, not just in western New York, but in the state. Uh, Leah Halton Pope, many people thought, would uh, bide her time and run to replace her boss when Crystal People Stokes decided to retire, but instead... She's jumping in now, and uh, and Darius Bridgen stood with her at her when she announced her candidacy and said, "I can't think of a better person." Um, but she's not the only one. There's a, a fellow named Matt Deering, who uh, used to work for Assemblymember Pat Burke. He worked on uh, Nate McMurray's campaigns for Congress. He has been uh, active in sort of progressive leftist democratic circles for the last couple of years and mm -hmm. is counting on their support. Uh, another guy who's jumped in is a former Buffalo cop named Cedric Holloway. Mm -hmm. He is also well known in, uh, in his community, in that community. Uh, he also has sort of institutional political support. Uh, and then there are a couple wild cards too. The Reverend Michael Chapman, who uh, of St. John Baptist Church, he um, 
he said that he's running. Now, I haven't seen or heard of any sort of political activity from his camp, and he's not a Democrat. He would be running, presumably, in the general election. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, so that doesn't have... That doesn't have implications for for the this. primary. For June, I didn't but, know that. Interesting. Yeah, and and another wild card who might also appear both in the Democratic primary and in the general election if he doesn't win the Democratic primary is Eddie Egru, who is a guy. I've been told that Eddie has been circulating petitions. He um, he will run. I imagine the Democratic primary. He's run for lots of offices, lots of times. Uh, last year he mounted. Uh, one in a series of challenges to Congressman Brian Higgins. He got on the ballot, but he did not fare particularly well. Interesting. Uh, but he may be in the mix, too. Hmm. Um, you mentioned that Pridgen has um, indicated that Halton Pope should be the next, but the Democratic Party has not, in this district, noted who they're backing. Is that correct? That is correct, and that may be uh, a function of the fact that Leah Halton Pope has institutional support, uh, but so does Cedric Holloway. And Hmm. so maybe they just don't want to meddle. Uh, Maybe there's too much division among the uh, committee members, the Democratic Party committee members in that district. Now, uh, the Buffalo News reported that it had to do a little bit with the uh, redistricting and the way that committee members, who, generally speaking, decide the endorsement or are supposed to, be the ones who vote on it. Uh, some of them were in the Ellicott District, and now they're not anymore, and maybe there would be confusion and hard feelings. I think it more has to do with the fact that uh, that there are candidates in the race who lay claim to different sort of factions of committee members in the district. Mm. So it would kind of it wouldn't be a unanimous vote as um, Charlie Specht in the Buffalo News had noted. Probably not. And why have a fight over it? Why not let the candidates just run? Interesting. The other thing, too, is that uh, it's worth noting the Democratic Party endorsement in a city council race, it's certainly not a detriment, but it doesn't help you that much. Hmm. The only thing that helps you is uh, hard work and connections in the community. The the, The Democratic Committee is not going to probably commit resources, money, and people Mm. to any of these races. If you're running for county legislator or for county clerk or something like that where you need more money and more volunteers to cover a broad geographic area, that's where you want the Democratic Committee on your side. But for a council race, your best bet is like shoe leather and and good conversation skills. Interesting. So do you see the Ellicott district race as being really just up in the air? Uh, It depends. So one caveat to this whole conversation is people are out right now getting signatures on Mm -hmm. nominating petitions. Now, those are due, uh, have to be turned in by next Friday. I think that's the 6th of April. And uh, that will determine the legitimacy of those petitions, will determine who gets on the ballot at all. If everybody who wants to be on the ballot gets on the ballot, if there are three or four candidates in the Democratic uh, primary for Ellicott District, that makes it really hard to predict. Mm. Um, and furthermore, you know, then projecting into the general, if there are also a couple of candidates on minor party lines, for example, who knows? Interesting. Well, let's switch to the Maston District. Sure. Is the Maston District race, would you suggest that this is the main event? Will, will people be looking at that race as, you know, more... Uh, telling of politics than other races? People will be freighting that race with a lot of meaning because of who's in it, uh, w- whether they uh, whether it deserves to be or not. Mm-hmm. They Because India Walton, who is this high-profile figure, beat the mayor in the Democratic primary two years ago and then lost in the general, caused quite a, it was a very interesting political summer, right? right? And in many ways, very ugly. So she is back. And uh, she is running a race in a district that she won in the general election and where she fared very well uh, in the primary two years ago. And it may well be that Ulysses Wingo retired rather than run for office again because she had the advantage over him, Hmm. which is a rare thing. Again, 20 years since an incumbent was unseated. But people worried 
that Wingo would be the next. Hmm. So he's not running again. Instead, you have Zenaida Everhart, who is this inc- incredibly charismatic uh, woman with with a heartbreaking story. Her son was injured at the May 14th Tops massacre. Uh, she has political chops, too. Uh, even before then, she was working for State Senator Tim Kennedy, mm-hmm. who is very uh, powerful in the state Senate, but also in the local Democratic Party. Um, so she clearly has institutional support and is there, I think, to beat off India Walton. Really? Yeah. Uh, and, of course, the Democrat Party has endorsed Everhart. They endorsed her right away. Right away. Yeah. Um, and I believe it was just two weeks ago yeah. that she uh, she threw her hat in the ring for that. It, it, yeah, it was the middle of February, and, and just a few days later, she accepted the Democratic Party endorsement. So do you see either one of these candidates or a third candidate? I'm unsure if there's someone else that might throw their hat in the ring. Do you see any any candidate here having an edge? It's, I, you know... I hate to predict anything because right. every time I do, I'm wrong. <laughs> so it's, it seems a curse for me to you know, say right, one right. candidate is favored over the other. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be a it's go- going to be the race to watch just for that reason. They both they are two black women, very charismatic, very smart, uh, very committed to their communities. It's going to be a really interesting race to watch mm-hmm. to see how they run it, to see how they interact with one another. You know, the race against India Walton, the the campaign against India Walton by the mayor and by his proxies got very, very ugly. I don't expect that will happen here, at least not forthrightly. Um, if it does, it will be interesting. You mentioned in your in your column from last week um, other fields, but, but these are uh, they're they're challenged, um, but there's an incumbent coming in. So tell me about the other. Yeah, the, so the, there's a couple of other uh, challengers who are running races. Catherine Franco is running uh, in the university district, and the incumbent is Rashid Wyatt. Uh, Franco challenged Wyatt four years ago, and she got on the ballot uh, successfully, which is not always an easy thing to do, uh, but she lost. So will she fare better this time? I don't know. I'm not sure if there are any significant demerits against Wyatt in the in the minds of voters. We'll see. Um, in the North District, an interesting challenge, Joe Golombek, who is currently the longest tenured uh, council member, he and also after, before Jimmy Griffin beat an incumbent, he was previously the last one to do that. Mm-hmm. So he is being challenged by Eve Shippens, who is a Buffalo public school teacher. And she, uh, she ran campaigns for uh, Jen McCosey, who is a, a member of the Buffalo School Board. Three campaigns, three successful campaigns. She was also central to uh, India Walton's uh, mayoral campaign. Mm-hmm. So she has political chops. She has community organizing chops. And she's a teacher, you know, and, and the teachers, teachers union and teacher support general generally is pretty valuable to have. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, how much of an uphill battle do you think that would be for Shippens uh, going up against someone that has decades long experience in the council? It's a huge uphill battle. Uh, Joe Golombek has been around long enough to attract a lot of criticism and probably, uh, uh, you know, a lot of detractors. But he has also built pretty strong relationships with community groups, with the people who vote. He knows who they are. He's Mm. a guy who knows every household in his district and what their voting patterns are. And I'm told he's working very hard uh, on this campaign already because I assume he doesn't want to take it for granted. Do you think that two years ago's upset in the primary was a wake-up call to people to take their election serious? Uh, I think it may have been to some degree. Uh, I will say that Joe Golombek was one who expressed his great uh, dismay at what India Walton said the night that she won the primary, Mm. which is the suggestion that we're coming for everybody, that everybody should look out because this new group, this uh, of progressive Democratic Party activists are going to target all incumbents. Building the infrastructure to challenge every damn thing. 
That's not exactly what she said, but that's certainly how incumbents heard it. And Joe mm-hmm. Golombek was one of those. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I think there's some of that. Well, from the other side of the aisle, um, more left-leaning Democrats uh, or socialist Democrats here in the city, do you think some of them might be upset that there's not more candidates out there running for these positions? I think there are. And, you know, I, I think there's some of that. I think um, it's it's a big ask of those who were the organizers behind India Walton's campaign, for example, and be behind various other campaigns, not necessarily for elected office, but for policies and what have you, uh, that they should that they should be solely responsible for changing the status quo. Mm-hmm. Certainly, candidates can arise from other quarters in in a different kind of uh, political ecology. You might even have people within the Democratic Party, like sort of mainstream establishment, you know, trying to kick open doors and make make uh, make their entry, uh, you know, onto the political mm-hmm. stage. You don't have that here a lot, hmm. not often. It's a it's a very sort of controlled system with not a ton of candidates, you know, sort of like itching to make their way. Uh, it, it, it's a curious thing. That's interesting. And, and that is a pretty good segue into another question that I wanted to bring up um, with uh, Catherine Franco uh, challenging Rashid Wyatt in university. Um, back in 2019, Franco was among other women that were trying to get on the ballot but didn't get on the ballot. That's well, right. Franco did, but the others didn't. Just how hard is it to even get on the ballot to get your foot in the door to even get a vote? There are giant pitfalls in the uh, in the nominating petition process. Uh, it's it's a tried and true practice for uh, for sort of entrenched candidates and entrenched machines to challenge the legitimacy of nominating petitions. Now this year, you need to get 500 signatures to appear in the Democratic primary uh, for Common Council. Uh, But you'd better get at least 1,000, because as soon as your petition is turned in, either the elections commissioners themselves or lawyers uh, hired by your opponent are going to vet your signatures and look for any little thing that's wrong with the signature or with an entire page. And there ensues, you know, challenges back and forth, sometimes court action, and a lot of times uh, petitioners just, their petitions get thrown out and they don't even appear huh. on the ballot at all, so all that hard work wasted. In 2019, there were a group of um, women who wanted to run for office. Very welcome development because uh, it's been nothing but men right. on the Common Council right. for, for 10 years. Uh, a number of them all got kicked off the ballot. All of their petitions were ruled invalid in one fell swoop because they had all used the same form, and the form was wrong. Uh. It was just deficient. It just it didn't have the things that state election law says it has to have. Really, Catherine Franco m- must have gotten some good advice because she looked at that form, I guess, and said, I think I'll make my own. Huh. And so she got on the ballot while the people, the other women with whom she'd sort of strategized a little bit, it wasn't like a, a slate, exactly. Sure, sure. Uh, they were more like mutual aid. Uh, they all got kicked off. Wow. And the result of that was Wyatt winning two to one. Yeah. 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 Well, um, in, in that, well, actually in any district, um, are we seeing... Uh, multiple people trying to do something similar? Um, are there other candidates that might not um, be the A-listers at this point? Yeah, yeah, there are. And I, and I apologize to those I left out of the column last week and promise if they make it on the ballot, they'll get coverage uh, in the months of to course, come. Of course. Uh, first and foremost, in the Lovejoy district, Ashley Brunner, uh, who was a member of the now dissolved Buffalo Police Advisory Board uh, and is also a sort of neighborhood and community activist. Um, She is out there collecting signatures on a petition to run against incumbent Brian Bowman. That's in the Lovejoy District. Uh, I mentioned Eddie Egrew. 
uh, in Ellicott District. I understand that uh, that he's circulating petitions. Also in Fillmore, uh, I understand Mohammed Alam, who's Bangladeshi and who ran in 2019 when that was an open seat uh, caused by a re the retirement of David Frangic. Uh, he ran then, um, he lost, uh, but I am told that he is collecting signatures on a petition hoping to challenge uh, incumbent Mitch Nowakowski, mm -hmm. who's going for his second term. Mm -hmm. Um, is there anything and there may be others. Again, right, we'll, we'll right, yeah. in a week from, from Friday, mm -hmm. we'll find out. We'll find out who actually shows up at the Board of Elections with a sheaf of paper, papers with signatures. And but from what you were just saying, um, when we find out in two weeks and a week um, who is attempting to get on the ballot, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to get on the ballot. That's right. Next week, they, they turn in their work. Uh, for the next week or two, people will pick away at it. Uh, you have to file p challenges pretty quickly, but then the, uh, the sort of judgment and sometimes, as I say, court action, sometimes you end up going to court and asking a judge to rule, is, does this signature count? Do I still have enough? Um, that, that can take a couple of weeks. Now, you didn't mention this in your column, um, and I, I'm not sure if this even has an answer yet. Uh, since we're just dealing with kind of who is trying to get on the ballot. But are there any main issues that candidates are going to be focusing on um, going into this primary? So the issues that council members will run on will differ a bit from district to district. But in the end, they all sort of, there are bread and butter issues, which are crime, are my streets and sidewalks being paved? Right. Is my park clean and safe? Uh, because we have district councilmen and no, uh, no longer any uh, at-large citywide elected councilmen, the districts issue, the districts tend to, they focus on local issues instead of on the big picture, the whole city issues. Um, and it's hard sometimes, I think, for a councilman running in one district to take these larger issues and run on those. So it, it ends up being sort of like, you know, is my garbage getting picked up? What about hmm. this park on the corner? Is this developer a good developer? What's happening at the end of my block? Interesting. Uh, well, one answer that I took um, to heart from uh, Darius Pridgen, uh, who is retiring from politics for now, um, is uh, he never answers a question that he's not asked. Uh, but I will pose to you, is there anything that we're missing here? <laughs> not yet. I, th I think we've covered what we can cover until we actually know who the voters are right. going to choose from.